Hello everyone and welcome to another educational presentation delivered by a webcast uh, brought to you by SNEER Europe and today we're going to be talking about transactional models and their storage requirements. My name is Paul Talbot and I'm the General Manager for SNEER Europe and my role today is to act as the moderator for one of our uh, most esteemed uh, presenters, Mr. Alex McDonald. Alex, could you quickly introduce yourself? Morning, Paul. Lovely day here. Excellent. Okay, I hope you're not sweltering too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. So let me uh, let me start just with a few key points regarding the uh, Bright Talk interface, especially for those of you who may not have attended one of these previously. Uh, firstly, you can expand the screen size. Uh, this may be important as you go along, as the uh, some of the slides may be a, a little difficult to read. Just enlarge the screen to full screen mode if that's a problem. Uh, secondly, you can ask questions during the presentation by selecting the Ask Question option and uh, entering your question. Uh, we will try to cover the, some of these during the presentation. I'll rudely interrupt Alex if uh, one comes through. And uh, we may also have some time at the end of the presentation uh, to do others. And then thirdly, and, and very importantly, you can rate the presentation. Uh, this is pretty important to us as it gives us a solid indication of whether we're delivering the right uh, content and quality to you. Uh, so please rate the uh, presentation at the end. A score of one means you'd rather have uh, spent the time more wisely and a score of five means it was perfect for you. Uh, of course, you can also send us comments and feedback on our webcast program afterwards. Let us know if there's any other topics you want to, to hear about. Uh, you'll find all our contact details on our website at www.sneer.org. So for anyone who doesn't know who we are, uh, Sneer is a global not-for-profit association and we're dedicated to advancing the adoption of storage technology. We have affiliated chapters around the world that provide the local representation, uh, which is why this webcast is being brought to you by SNEER Europe. We use our vendor neutral status to develop industry-wide standards, and we enlist the help of our subject matter experts amongst our membership community that provide marketing and promotional programs uh, to aid the adoption. Uh, we provide a, an extensive range of educational materials on storage technology, uh, not only to help the industry, but also to help the storage user community to better understand uh, implementation and deployment challenges. Those uh, educational materials take many forms, uh, not just webcasts like this one, uh, but you'll see our presence at uh, many industry events as well, uh, giving talks on uh, storage technology subjects. So just before we get into the detail of the presentation, uh, this is just a standard legal disclaimer from SNEER. Uh, the purpose of this is just to remind you that uh, the material is SNEER copyright and detail the uh, conditions under which the material can be used. And also to state that we're not providing any legal advice here um, and it's not providing any warranties, either expressly or implied, uh, in the content of this presentation. So really the use of this material is at your own risk. And so without any further delay, please allow me to uh, hand over to Alex, who will start today's presentation. Thank you, Paul. And welcome to everybody. And my well, uh, welcome to Paul's welcome. So I want to talk today about transactional models and their storage requirements. I, I think the topic is increasingly important because we're facing a drastic change in the way that we look at and understand what we mean by transactions. And what I'd like to do to actually illustrate this point is to give you a briefish history of transactions and where we've come from talk a little about some of the current transactional systems that we have and the way that we deal with transactions, and then look to the future, look to the future of transactions and, and, and 
put a perhaps a stake in the sand that there's a few years out and talk about different models for providing uh, transaction-based systems. And then there's somebody at the back end that talks about transactions and storage requirements. So th this is a pretty big subject, and I'm, I'm going to cover it in fairly light uh, level. Uh, this is not an in-depth, detailed analysis, but if there's any further conversations you want, as Paul indicates, we've got a website out there, and you can get in contact with us, and we can continue this conversation online and on the blog that we have, should that be what you want to do. So, without further ado, let's start with talking about transactions, a briefish history. So, what is a transaction? And there are several definitions. These presentations often start with a definition, don't they? So, here's my definition. The definition here is an input message to a computer system dealt with as a single unit of work. That's not terribly useful, to be quite frank. And, and, and I think a better way of thinking of it is a piece of information or an action, an action that moves the system from one state to another. And I'll give examples of that as we go through this presentation. So the system, whatever it is, maintains at least the current state where we, where we started out. We then apply some change to it, the action, and then we retain this new knowledge that we have of the new state that we're in and potentially sometimes also the old state we were in, so we can see how we got from A to B. And that's effectively a transaction. It's got some other characteristics, though. It's persistent. It extends over a prolonged period. In other words, transactions just don't happen and then disappear. And secondly, they're durable. They're able to withstand uh, wear and tear or damage, because some of the transactions we're going to be talking about are, for instance, financial transactions, that are incredibly important. So to give you a couple of examples of a transaction, Paul uh, could transfer 10 Australian dollars. Paul's based out in Australia, notwithstanding his very, very English accent. He's actually based in Australia, and he might want to transfer $10 from his bank account to mine. Highly unlikely, I know, but it is potentially one thing that he could decide to do. <clears throat> And that would be a transaction. I think it's more, more unlikely to get $10 out of your account, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's actually, that's actually an equally powerful point. Uh, my wife, Carol. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's your point. I had to poke first. So my wife, Carol, might want to book an airline ticket and reserve a particular seat, let's say seat 17A, and that might be seen as a, a, trans a, a classic type of a transaction. Uh, my daughter might want to borrow a book. That library on the right-hand side is pre-technology. It's a beautiful place. It's the uh, Trinity College Library in Dublin, one of the most magnificent buildings I've ever been in. It's, it's quite fabulous. She might want to borrow a book from Trinity College Library, and I can assure you, if you borrow a book from Trinity College Library, they're going to know exactly who's borrowing it, where it's going, and when it's going to be returned. Or my other daughter might want to put up a new picture on Facebook. These are all types of transactions and they're wide and varied but basically there's what's involved is a piece of information that moves a system from one state to another and we record that fact now transactions have been around for quite a long time actually uh, primarily they were first when we first see transactions they are of exchange or financial in nature and they were recorded in ledgers and you can see in the top right hand side there there's a, a, that's a Sumerian uh, clay tablet, and that dates from way back. I mean, that's something like you know 3,000 years plus 2 to 5,000 years ago. It's a long time ago. And that's a record of a financial transaction marked in, an in, in, in a permanent medium. And those transactions are recorded in ledgers, and those ledgers record the basics um, uh, the six good men and true, as I call them, uh, what, why, when, how, where, and who are recorded on that ledger to record that financial or transactional event. And generally, permanent storage were things like clay and papyrus. And later, but pre-computer, we moved to paper. And there's still a huge amount of paper around. I still get invoices and bills arriving through through, through my letterbox. And that very often they are still recorded that way. But we're going to extend this idea of the transaction beyond the financial a bit later. 
But originally, financial events recorded on a permanent medium, and as you can see, they've been around for about 5,000 years, which is pretty good going for an idea. So the early computer systems that we started seeing, the first, to my knowledge, was Lyons Leo. And Leo was the Lyons Electronic Office. Leo, Lyons was an interesting company. It was actually a bakery company with a, a series of outlets on street corners selling coffee and cakes. And they were very innovative, though, as an organization, even though their business was relatively old-fashioned. And their first business application was in November 1951. I mean, that's a long time ago. That's, goodness, what's that, nearly 70 years ago. And those first computerized applications were payroll and inventory. The storage devices were fascinating. They used paper tape, card, they had a line printer, uh, they used magnetic tape, and also there was a, a an ultrasonic delay line memory, which I find quite fascinating, used as 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 as, as uh, the equivalent, I suppose, of main memory that we would have on our computers now, or DRAM, which was uh, made of mercury and had uh, around eight and three quarter kilobytes of storage capacity. Quite an amazing thing. But it was the first significant change from taper in thousands of years. And Leo was a very innovative system in terms of its ability to do transactions. Then we saw between the 60s, 70s, 80s and onwards, the rise of databases and financial machines. And banking and financial drove this uh, idea of transactional systems. And the majority of paper ledgers at that point were transferred to a digital form in databases. And we had companies like IBM and Burroughs and Sperry and Univac and all these names that are now uh, ancient history. Well, most of them are ancient history apart from IBM. Uh, providing bank clearing systems on databases like IMS or DB2. And then later they were joined by uh, databases like Oracle, which were relational databases. We had DASD dev devices and joined, joined tape. So originally a lot of these systems were tape-based, and we ended up with these disk-based devices, uh, account key data devices in the case of IBM way back in the 1960s and very often fixed block devices as well, which is where we currently have our existing hard disk technology from. They're all fixed block, fixed block size on a track, on a spinning magnetic media with arms that read and write the data onto that surface. And the people involved in these kind of systems at that time, there were some seminal papers, and I actually have some of the links at the back end of this presentation, but there are two worth noting. There was uh, Jim Gray, um, who did a lot in terms of database and transaction processing research. Um, uh, the paper at the back end is a very interesting historical read from about 20, 25 years ago. And Cotton Date's relational database theory that gave us uh, things like SQL databases, Oracle, uh, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So there were an awful lot of interesting developments taking place in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and as we went through this rise of database and financial machines. So having looked at the historical stuff, I want now to cover some of the current transactional systems that we have and try and get a, a perhaps a slightly better definition of what we mean by transaction because there are some key concepts that we need to understand. And that affects the kind of storage we think of as of being appropriate and also the kind of processing we think of as being appropriate for the management and the recording of these transactions. So in terms of current transactional systems, let's look, take a look at some database types to start with. There are around about four ways of classifying databases. Now, this is a loose classification. You are not to take from this classification that these things are absolutely their nature. They are simply some characteristics that many databases have, and we've, we've organized them into four loose types of database, but some are more suitable than others. We'll talk about that in a little while when we talk about the CAP theorem, uh, which is about consistency, availability, and partitionability. We'll talk about CAP in terms of these databases. We'll also talk about acidity, or atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable transactions in terms of some of these databases. But it's interesting to note the different types and the different uses to which we might put them, and hence the underlying storage that they might live on. So we've got relational databases, like, for instance, Oracle. Relational in the sense that we have tables that we can relate. We have 
keys that we can relate one key in or one column in one table to another column in another table and then match up the rows to get uh, uh, databases that are basically broken down into the smallest units possible in terms of the data content but linkable together via these keys to provide you with different views of the same data. So for instance, being able to see transactions by date and time or being able to see transactions by person. Then there are the key value type of databases where I have a key and I can ask the system to return the data associated with that key. Very much simpler type of database. Tabular databases, that everything is organized in big tables. And, and in fact, one of the names of one of these technologies is called Big Table, which kind of gives the, the, the game away. Document-based uh, databases, which are most suitable for unstructured data. So a wide variety of database types. The types do overlap. Some have features that are in common with others. But it is a useful, if a slightly loose classification. And I've color-coded them there so you can actually see the, the different types of database. And I've given a sample list of some of them. On, on the right hand side. So before we go much further, I want to talk about this thing acidity in terms of transactions. And this is where the early theorists about databases came up with this acronym ACID. And transactions can be described as ACID because they have four characteristics. Uh, no, it's not that kind of ACID I've got on the right hand side. This is a different kind of ACID. This is about atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability. So let's take them one at a time. Atomicity, a transaction is all or nothing. It either all succeeds or it all fails. Now let me give you an example of an atomic transaction. If I am sending 10 pounds, God forgive me, but let's assume I was going to send 10 pounds to Paul, then I would want to make sure that the, as the 10 pounds left my bank account, it appeared in his bank account. And if it didn't make it to his bank account, the £10 wouldn't have left my bank account. So it's an all or nothing. Either it happens or none of it happens. And in fact, the transaction is, in a sense, indivisible. It's atomic. It's like an atom. I can't break that atom up any further. It's, it's the, the indivisible unit uh, in terms of the way it's recorded. Consistency is about moving from one state to another. And again, consistency talks about the fact that I should not have a system that appears to be inconsistent. So for instance, to give you an example, I should not have a system that shows that one minute I have a thousand pounds, that the next minute, without any transactions having taken place or anything appeared to have happened, I've only got 900 pounds. So that kind of consistency, as I move transactions, I shouldn't end up with invalid states. I shouldn't end up seeing, for instance, less money than I should have or more money than I should have. Isolation is about making sure that transactions are concurrent. In other words, if I run things in parallel or I mix things up or I've got hundreds of transactions that I pull together, isolation makes sure that transactions appear as though they happened serially, one thing after another. And that's quite important in terms of time ordering. A system needs to look like it has some form of time order. And that's what isolation provides us with, the ability to guarantee that we're moving from one state to another, and it appears we've done so serially, even though we may be doing things in parallel. And last but not least, durability. Once I've committed that transaction, it sticks. It doesn't matter what happens. I can lose power. I can have um, you know, some kind of cat catastrophic accident with my system. And if I rebuild it, that transaction should still be there. Durability is a really important uh, aspect of transactions. And we'll see when we talk about, I'm going to talk a little later about blockchain, how blockchain is possibly providing us with some of the most durable systems that we can currently contemplate. So that's acidity, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And that's been a feature of transaction systems since time immemorial. But we codified them when we were designing our new modern uh, computer-based uh, transaction systems. So the other question we have about transactions is locking. One of the, one of the, one of the things that acidity asks us to do is we have to think about locks. Now, locking is a case of I don't want 
for instance, to have three transactions all take place simultaneously in my bank account and the updates not take place properly. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say I make three £10 transactions to Paul and that I go out and I subtract £10 from my account and then add £10 to Paul's. But in the meanwhile, I've also taken another £10 out of my account, not yet moved it to Paul's, and I've got a system whereby I've only got £80 left out of the 100 and Paul's got only got £10 of the £20 I've transferred so far. That's not actually a really desirable state of affairs. Now, maybe updating things uh, several times over. There may be several different transactions taking place on my bank account. And I need to make sure that I can lock it that so only one transaction at a time can take place against my bank account. And to come up with that idea of locking and making sure we only do things one at a time, we've only got one writer to this system, if you like, is two-phase commit. And two-phase commit is all about providing consistency. Uh, two-phase commit is all about getting everyone to agree that they're ready. We agree to the various parts of the transaction. We all say we're ready at the same time, and then we commit. We all commit simultaneously, and that transaction has been done in a two-phase approach. The first phase is gaining agreement. The second phase is commitment. And that's been quite a popular way of doing transactional-based locking for quite some time. The trouble is that expensive. It's actually really expensive holding a lock. Let me give you an example why it's expensive. Let's say I'm actually working on my bank account and transferring money. How many other people do you think are working on my bank account in exactly the same time I am? The chances are not many. In fact, the chances are very, very small, but they're not zero. So I need to take a lock anyway and that makes it very expensive and hard to make a cynic when you're dealing with distributed transactions across multiple geographic nodes. You know, Paul's in Australia, I'm in the UK. That transfer of money, it's difficult to make that acidic and do this two-phase commit when there's at least a half-second delay due to the speed of light between Australia and here. That kind of thing is very difficult when you've got high trans uh, transaction latencies. And it's really difficult, incredibly difficult, when humans do the locking. And I'll show you a transaction system where humans do the locking. And we are terrible at locking. I mean, we, could, we can do things that could take minutes rather than milliseconds. So it's very difficult to have two-phase commits. So transactional two-phase commit and acidity are beginning to be really difficult to do in these global systems that we're developing. If you think back to the 60s, 70s, and 80s, all the transactions were taking place in one data center, probably within 100 feet of each other. So that, that transactional system is quite easy to manage. The modern transactional systems can span the entire globe, and that makes them much more difficult to do. So let me give you an example of an online web transaction. So we've got a web-based payment system. Uh, I think we're all fairly familiar with this. You go to Amazon, you buy something, or eBay, or your favorite retailer, and you get a invitation to make a purchase by card. The vendor website interfaces with a credit card application. And there's two-phase commit between the website application and the credit card application. And it's the applications that do the locking. The, the locking is done at the application level because we want to make sure, as a, a vendor, that we're getting our money before we ship the goods. That's the normal course of events. You know, you buy something from me, I make sure I've got your money first, then I'll ship you the goods. So the applications act as lock managers, and if your credit card gets refused, the goods don't get shipped. And if in, a, in essence, at, the, at, at this level, the application is doing the locking, the web-based sales application to the online uh, credit card application. So that's applications as lock managers. We've also got humans as lock managers. <coughs> Do, excuse me. So I don't know if you've ever booked an airline ticket and then tried to book a seat. So you book your ticket first, they get your money. They do that web-based two-phase commit transaction to make sure that they've got your money. And at that point, they invite you to select a seat. So we're gonna reserve a seat. So we go along, we get a map of the cabin, we click on the seat, we press, yeah, that's the seat we'd like. 
And most times it works, but sometimes it doesn't. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this. I've only experienced it very infrequently. But occasionally it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that somebody else was booking the same seat at the same time, and neither of us locked it. There's no locking available here. All that happens is that one of those transactions fails because what was previously a free seat is now a busy seat, and we have to go back through the loop again of selecting another seat. So the customers become resource managers. The customer becomes the lock manager. The customer has to do that rescheduling of the transaction. And, oh, it didn't work. Go click on the seat again. Go reserve my new seat. So there's customers as resource managers. And that's a different type of locking. That's locking by human beings. Now, that kind of locking is hugely expensive in terms of time. We may be you know, 10 minutes sitting there thinking, I wonder what seat I want this time. Do I want a bulkhead seat? Do I want one next to the window? Why are there no aisle seats available? Oh dear, I'm in the middle again. That kind of thing takes time. And there's no point in the system locking all the seats just for me to take five minutes to select one of them. Because that's what we'd have to do if we were doing locking at that level. So it just doesn't bother. It eventually becomes consistent in that I either get the seat I want or I didn't but it's not a, a locked transaction in that sense. So that brings us on to CAP, because this is a classic application of CAP. And the CAP theorem uh, is a fairly well-known theorem about three attributes that uh, transactions can have. The C stands for consistency. Consistency is everybody having the same view. If you remember our airline seats, not everybody has the same view. I think this seat is free, but somebody else knows that they've just booked it, so there's no consistency there. The consistency is all clients, everybody who looks at this system, having the same view. Consistency is important when it comes to bank accounts, but not airline seats. A is for availability. The clients can always read and write. In other words, there's always access between the client and the back-end application or database that it's talking to. And P is for partition tolerance. If bits of the system break, the whole thing doesn't break. The whole thing continues to work. So in other words, I can have clients that fail or servers that fail, but the system muddles along and it still works. And the CAP theorem says you can choose any two of these attributes, but not three. You can't have them all. You can have two of them, but not three of them. So we can either have systems that are consistent and available, and they're marked up on the left-hand side, uh, things like Oracle and MySQL, but they will not be partition tolerant. As we all know, databases of that nature tend to be quite fragile in the sense that bits break, the whole thing tends to break. On the right-hand side, we've got those that are available and partition tolerant, but aren't consistent. They might be eventually consistent. There might be a point at which everything catches up, but they're not consistent from point in time perspective. And they're things like Cassandra or CouchDB. And then we've got things that are consistent or partition tolerant, and those are the ones at the bottom, but they're not always available. It's not always possible to write or read from these systems. Sometimes that aspect of the system fails. So the CAP theorem says you can have any two from three and these are the kind of modern transaction systems that we're looking at. And we'll talk a little about that as we talk about the future. And I'll use blockchain as an example of, of, this, of this theorem in action. So that's an imperfect world. So how does storage help? Well, if you think about storage systems and acidity, this atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, these kind of things can be assisted by your underlying storage system. So let's take one of them, for instance, durability. One of the things we, one of the things that fascinates me about the storage industry is that if you give us a byte of data today, we will guarantee to return you the same byte of data at some indeterminate point in the future that's not been corrupted. It's a fascinating promise that the storage industry makes that whatever you give us, we will retain perfectly for as long as you wish to retain it. And that kind of durability is really important in certain types of transactional systems. If you think of the Sumerians with their clay tablets, there's a 5,000-year-old 
durable piece of information. It's probably outlived the goods that it was actually describing being transacted. You know, it's probably grains that, that have gone or, or cloth or whatever. But that transaction persisted for 5,000 years. And that's the kind of thing that a good storage system will also provide you with is strong durability. The other thing it can provide you with is this idea of a snapshot, the idea that we can take a point in time freeze of a system. And that helps with transactional type systems. If you think about, uh, for instance, and the example might be quiescing an Oracle database and taking a snapshot so that we have a point in time that's completely consistent. And that consistency can be provided by our underlying uh, storage system as well. So with the help of storage, we can provide consistency. And this idea of moving from valid state to valid state is very important. And this covers everything. This covers everything from all the way from the cache right out to the SST or a traditional disk. A good storage system will, can help you provide uh, acidity in terms of transactional-based systems. Plus, obviously, it provides other things as well that are nice to have, like encryption and compression and deduplication, all the things we expect from a fairly advanced storage system. So we tend to have block-based for traditional high-volume and low-latency transactions, also known as SAN. And there are programmatic interfaces into the storage subsystem that allow us to do these kind of things. And the example I used earlier, I've repeated here again, Doing an Oracle quiesce, we quiesce the Oracle system, we stop all the transactions that are coming through, and we just hold them back, and then we do a snapshot of the storage system, and then we can restart the transactions again. And that snapshot has given us a consistent point in time that we can use to recover back to, or use as a backup, or use for auditing, or whatever kind of work we want to undertake on that consistent transactional system. So that's how a sound might just help. Ask, uh... Yeah, sure. Yeah, can I just ask a question about the SAN? Why, why do you mention SAN particularly there in terms of uh, being the basis for low latency transactions? Could you not do it without a SAN? Yeah, you can, you, I'll, I'll talk about some of the other uh, kinds of storage as well. One of the things that, that SANs give us is, and, and it doesn't matter how they're constructed, it doesn't matter whether they're constructed with hard disks or SSDs, but one of the things that SAN gives us is high bandwidth and low latency. A, a SAN is a local storage system. It's not a geographically spread out uh, system. It's a local storage system with very low latency and very high bandwidth. And these kind of systems are used because transaction volumes nowadays can be absolutely huge. You know, the number of financial transactions carried out worldwide is in the, you know, it's in the millions per second and it's in the billions per day. And that volume of transaction processing needs to be dealt with in a very efficient manner. And SANs are, to a large degree, the most popular way and successful way of delivering these transaction-based storage systems. So that, that's why we look at this. That's why we consider SANs for that particular purpose. High bandwidth, low latency, uh, and large volumes right. as well. They can they can support quite large volumes of data. Okay. So the other way of looking at it as well is file-based systems. So we've got file-based for a variety of solutions. So for instance, some of these document databases can use NAS. Now NAS is basically a, 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 a hierarchical directory and file-based system. And what NAS systems provide us with it is byte range locking. We can actually lock files at the byte range. So we can have a database that's made up of a large file, and we can lock various parts of it to provide ourselves with transaction consistency. And you can run SQL databases, not just on SANS, but also on NAS. And also document and object type stores fit quite well into this, although object type stores are cover separately. There's a new set of technologies coming along there. But in terms of file-based, that also provides us with transactions that are Internet of Things. If you think about the Internet of Things, which are things or objects or pieces of technology at the edges of our network that are collecting data or responding to data, a file is a good way of looking at these things. And in fact, file-based systems, there's quite a lot of IoT or Internet of Things, specific file systems and protocols 
to allow you to do transactions out to the edge and pull that data in. And they're all file-based. So file-based can provide you with a variety of solutions for the underlying uh, transactional nature of the data that you're trying to manage. Alex, we have a question. Yeah, I've just seen it. That's an interesting one. What is byte level locking not present in SAN? In fact, block level locking is. You can block at the you can lock at the block level. Uh, and in fact the SCSI protocol supports locking. The trouble with that is that locking is done at the device level. And I might be sharing these devices. So applications nowadays normally do the the, the, the locking. And if you think about it, a file system is basically doing byte level locking at the application level rather than at the device level. So on a SAN, we tend to have the ability to lock at the device level, which we don't use. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the, it's the database application that does the locking. And that's because we're sharing these devices and they're not really real devices. We've virtualized them and we're having to address them as virtual devices. So the, the locking is done at the application level. If the art locking is done at the application level, one thing that still comes through is the fact that a SAN device is block-based. So we tend still to block-based lock rather than byte-based lock. And the other thing we do at the application level that's using a SAN is we lock at the transactional level as well, or in preference, actually. So I can lock with an application that row that represents my bank account balance. Now, I don't know where that row is, and I'm not really interested because it's the application that's doing the locking. So I can do row-level locking rather than byte-level locking. So there's a variety of ways of doing locking, but at the end of the day, it has to be done at the appropriate level. It has to be done at the level we can manage it and the level that other things can see it. So we're moving away from the old methods of locking at the device level, and we lock now at the application level. And as we see in a second or two, we're going to stop locking altogether because locking, as I mentioned earlier, is horribly expensive and you generally don't need to do it, but there's that non-zero chance you might have to, which is why we still do it. So in terms of uh, the other one is object drives and systems. And this is the kind of system whereby I've got key value support for some of those key value type databases. And here I have a key that I pass to the device and it passes me back the data associated with that key. Now that's a, a, a different way of thinking of the data again and the different way of managing it. And some of these in terms of their transaction use are quite interesting. One of the things we don't do with object systems is update the object. Let's take a photograph on Facebook for instance. Let's say I take a photograph, put it up on Facebook. I create a record with a photograph in it. Do I update that photograph? Well, if I update the photograph, actually what I'm really doing is deleting the old photograph and replacing it with a new photograph. I'm not actually updating individual bytes in that at all. And in fact, even though I edit that picture, it's highly likely I'm not editing the object. I'm actually replacing the object once I've made all my edits. So in object-based systems, our transaction becomes a slightly different affair in that we're not modifying the original thing. This is not a a create, read, update, delete type operation. It is, in fact, a create, read, no update and delete type operations. And we're replacing these uh, records in, in the database. So key value are, are slightly different. A lot of them don't permit you to update the value. You have to rewrite the data in its entirety. entirety. The other thing that's quite interesting about these, some of these devices are very smart indeed. So instead of just supporting key value, we've now got computational storage that are smart drives that allow you to go out there and do things like, say, for instance, uh, run SQL databases on the drive, and you can actually query the drive with SQL. What are the advantages of that? Well, let's say I'm trying to count all the objects that are read on that disk drive. Traditionally, what I'd have to do is go out there, read all the data in, all of it, select out those that were read, count them up, and then throw away all that data that I've just spent transferring it over the network to the CPU simply to count the number that are read. What if I could actually go out to the device and say, you count them. You just tell me how many read objects there are. 
And if you've got none, I won't bother you again because I'm not really interested. I'm looking for red objects. And the device can come back and say to you, you asked how many red objects there were, there are three. So that's a really smart device that allows us to reduce network traffic and also gives us a different view again of transactions because transactions now have to take place in a different domain. They have to take place with an application on our storage device. So these new object drives and systems will change again the way that we're able to manage and look at transactions. So, Alex, we have a, um, 20 minutes left. Thank you, Paul. So that was a brief look of where we are. Now I want to do some speculative stuff and just talk about the future of transactions. I'm going to use uh, an example for this. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, blockchain because it seems to be um, of great interest to people at the moment. So this is a sort of little primer in blockchain and why blockchain transactions demand a completely different kind of storage again. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've talked about the imperfect world of transactions. We've talked about transactions that are acidic, transactions that are local, transactions that are eventually consistent, a bit like the airline booking system. Transactions that can operate globally are different from transactions that operate locally. So there are, there are a wide variety of ways of doing this. But one of the things that's become really important is uh, uh, these days it is cryptocurrency. You may have come across Bitcoin. And Bitcoin uses blockchain. Bitcoin is not blockchain. It, it uses blockchain as part of its technique. But it's an interesting way of managing transactions and recording things in ledgers where you don't have the ability to be acidic. You would like to be acidic, but you don't have the ability. The cap theorem comes into play, and we don't have consistency or availability or partitionability across all of our data in terms of viewing it as a set of consistent transactions. And blockchain fixes some of these prob uh, problems that we have. They're basically cryptographically secured ledgers. And these crypto ledgers, as they're sometimes abbreviated to, can have executable event triggered actions associated with them. So in other words, I can do things like put contracts into this ledger and have the contract executed automatically. And if the contract is in the ledger, then I know it's a real contract it's the real McCoy, and whatever happens inside that cryptographically secured ledger, I can guarantee was actually intended. So let's take a little look at how this works. How a blockchain ledger works is you've got loads and loads of nodes. Now, you may want to expand your screen on this one because it's actually quite difficult to read otherwise. I apologize for the slightly small um, uh, font on this. So it's a decentralized ledger on multiple nodes. The same ledger is maintained across multiple nodes. So in other words, that data is replicated in the Bitcoin case across literally thousands of nodes. But each node has a copy of the entire chain of ledger entries. Now the ledger is actually maintained a bit like a paper ledger. We've got page one through page N. And the, basically we record all the transactions and then flip over the pages as we so each page can be considered to be a block in the ledger. And I show a, a couple of blocks here. So we've got the ledger block here at the top with the pink. And Alice's transaction request is to send one Bitcoin to Bob. So we make a change to the ledger and we re-record it back out there and pass it out to all the nodes. And the nodes record it correspondingly. So effectively, Alice sends one Bitcoin to Bob. It sends a message to the network. Alice has one Bitcoin reduced from the ledger. Bob gets plus one. And each node applies the transaction to their copy. And that's great. And that's the way we traditionally associate with transactional systems that our banks currently use for managing our money that, that we so kindly lend them. However, there's, a, there's an issue here, isn't there? One of security. So first of all, we need to address, address the issue of security. And then I'll address the issue of how do we know this transaction is actually genuine or not? So the way that we maintain money in a, in a, in a Bitcoin environment is through something called a wallet. And the wallet contains my data associated with my part of the ledger. In other words, Alice's balance might be 10 Bitcoin, and it's maintained inside her wallet. Now, Alice needs to make sure that she can do secure transactions with Bob so basically, or with the network, in fact, 
So basically what we have is this idea of private and public key encryption. And if you've not come across private and public key encryption before, it can seem rather mysterious, actually. But basically, you encrypt the message with a private key, and you can decrypt that message with the public key. And this technique allows us, key encryption allows us, is a digital signature for the message we're about to send to say, minus one from Alice, plus one to Bob. We can actually authenticate that that message came from Alice and should go to Bob because of the management of the keys. Bob will have my public key or Alice's public key. Alice will have a private key, and the two of them can be sure that they're communicating with each other because of this private public key interface that they have. So having got a wallet that is secure and an ability to move things in and out of that wallet that's secure, we now need to address the next problem, which is what happens with all these blockchains and how do we make sure that they get put in the right order? Because obviously, when we send a, a, a block to these bunches of nodes, there are thousands of them, and some of them may be not communicating with each other at the moment and event. You know, there may only be a, 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 a number of them that are operational. Bits of the network might have disappeared. There could be a variety of reasons that that block doesn't arrive simultaneously at all the nodes. And the way we temporarily order transactions, and that's temporal in the sense of time, not temporarily, as in the sense of only doing for a small period of time. How do we temporarily order the transactions? And we need to, because if you remember when we were doing that web transaction with a credit card, payment first, shipment second, but not the other way around. But we can't use timestamps. And the reason we can't use timestamps is these are globally distributed systems that are long delays between various parts of the network, and we can't use a central timestamp. So we, we order the transactions by grouping them into blocks of a fixed number of transactions, and we link in that block and into a, a, a set of chains uh, that are, we're developing that are copied on each of the nodes. So there's a link to the previous block, and that's why it's called blockchain, and they all transactions in that specific block, they're considered to have happened at the same time. What time is that? Don't really care. As long as it's consistent, the time is not important. We've got rid of the time element. And transactions that are not in that blockchain are not yet confirmed. They're unconfirmed. So how do we make sure that we confirm, confirm them? Any node can recommend the new block to be added to the system. So how do we know which are the genuine ones? The way we do that is by what is called proof of work. We do something that demonstrates that we've made the effort to make sure that these transactions are cryptographically secure. We do that by using an irreversible cryptographic hash function that calculates something about that block and then sends that block out to say, I've solved whatever puzzle it is, cryptographic puzzle it is, and here is the block you should be adding. And what happens then is the block gets added to the end of the chain because it cryptographically matches the block that precedes it. So in other words, block 126 in this example, I use that as the seed for some cryptographic function. So what I want to add is block 127. When I solve that puzzle, I send everybody block 127. They check their 126 block. They go, oh, yeah, these two are connected. Therefore, I can add them to the back of the blockchain. However, this other block I got through that was perhaps trying to solve a problem for block 124 but took too long to do so will become an orphan. It will simply be ignored because it's no longer in that cryptographic blockchain. And that's the way we add things to the ledger. And we make sure that we've got this effectively this right lock. If you think about it, all the blockchain cryptographic stuff is doing is going through a single scribe, the guy sitting in his tall stool in front of all these you know, pages in his ledger and writing them out. And only one person can talk to him at a time because only one person will solve the cryptographic puzzle that he gave them when they came up to get their money transferred or whatever transaction they might want. So the way the system does this is a completely different way of doing transactions that allows us to get consistency of transactions, but also allows us to do this in a geographically dispersed way and to do it with no trust. None of these nodes trusts each other. 
not necessarily needs to trust each other because they all know that they have to solve this incredibly hard puzzle to be able to add their block to the back of every blockchain that's out there and that's identical on every system that's, that's, that's involved in this particular uh, development of this particular blockchain, like, for instance, Bitcoin being one example of a blockchain. So the system is always consistent, and that's a really important uh, feature. So what does Alex, blockchain you have require? 10, 10 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Paul. So what do we require okay. in terms of blockchain and storage? Well, persistent memory, which is a new technology, and in fact, you should be aware that uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, companies like Intel have been announcing persistent memory. Persistent memory is like memory, in other words, it's byte addressable, but it's unusual in its persistence, like storage. Now, storage we tend to associate with being associated with blocks, but this stuff is actually byte addressable and persistent, and it's much faster than SSDs, and actually, it's, it's a little slower than DRAM, that's true. But it's a lot cheaper than DRAM. And it occupies a space in this uh, hierarchy of memory that I'll show you in a second. So it's got very high bandwidth and low latency. It's got guaranteed durability. And it allows you to in process an entire blockchain in memory for node processing. Because if you think of it, the blockchain grows and grows and grows and grows. But we're wanting to do transactions on various parts of the blockchain. We might want to go out and you know, uh, find out how much Alice has got in our wallet or move money that Alice deposited you know, 10 years ago to a new account. So that there are all sorts of transactions we might want to carry out on the entire blockchain, so the whole thing needs to be in memory. So for this kind of application, having persistent memory, everything in memory, and operating with a blockchain that is, if you like, addressable from beginning to end is quite important. You may wonder actually how big Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is around about 140 megabytes at the moment, and it's not a huge thing. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 140 gigabytes, I beg your pardon. So it's not a huge thing in terms of its total overall size. So you could contain this thing uh, within persistent memory. So memory storage and convergence very quickly. We're seeing this move where storage and memory are be almost becoming interchangeable in a sense. The only memory that we have now that doesn't persist is really DRAM. All the rest of our memory stack in terms of persistent memory all the way out to you know, very slow devices like tape and, 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 and uh, you know, slow spinning disk, the, all those are persistent. It's only DRAM that's no longer persistent. So we've, we've got a change in focus in the terms of the way that we can address storage and in terms of, of its persistence. And that's really important, again, from a transactional perspective. And we're also seeing the development of these really smart devices that allow us to ask questions of the device. And that's a different way of looking at it. Again, persistent storage that provides you with smarts that can actually go out there and answer questions without you having to transfer large volumes of data to get that answer. So a lot of changes at the moment in memory and storage. So a very quick summary. There's a changing role. Memory is becoming much more active than passive for recording information. Memory is becoming much smarter in that sense. And there's no single storage solution for all these issues that we might have from a transactional level because there are different kinds, I hope I've demonstrated anyway, there are different kinds of transactions and transaction requirements and therefore different kinds of storage and storage requirements. That's not to say there's a bit in the middle as well. There's different kinds of applications and databases required as well in terms of these um, new modern transactional systems that we're putting in place. But the future includes moving up the stack into memory and processor domain. Persistent memory is doing that for us, getting the stuff closer to the CPU. And storage is becoming more application-like, particularly things that are forcing us to think of it in that way are things like the Internet of Things, stuff at the edge, stuff at the edge that we can't get at on a regular basis too expensive to get out through networks, has to be smarter and has to be able to accomplish stuff on its own. And also new transactional models, things like blockchain that provide us with this new way of thinking about transactions and, and actually uh, providing secure, consistent, durable, available 
uh, systems that we've, we've, we've previously only seen with the Sumerians and their, and their, and their clay tablets. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me, just some brief info, additional information. The papers I mentioned at the front, uh, Jim Gray's and Andres Reuters, there's a PowerPoint out there on Microsoft uh, website, which covers transactions, uh, uh, state of the art from around about 2000. That's well worth reading. It's, it's a historical perspective of transactional systems. Uh, persistent memory, we're doing a lot of work in SNEA on that, and you'll find that link there. And there's a really good um, overview uh, by a guy called uh, Michael Dalliese, who did uh, an overview of Bitcoin and blockchain. It's well worth reading. A lot longer than this brief presentation, a lot more detail. But if you read that, I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree this is quite an interesting technology and has application much wider than just things like cryptocurrencies. So with that, over to you, Paul. Thank you for today. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, not too many questions as we went through, which I think is a compliment to the clarity of that presentation. Thanks very much. Um, that concludes today's webcast. Uh, but before you log out, a reminder to rate the presentation, please. Um, if you have any questions that remain unanswered or want to uh, make contact with us, uh, you definitely can. Uh, please email me at paul.talbot, that's T-A-L-B-U-T, at SNEAR.org. And if you want to be kept informed of future webcasts and, and SNEAR Europe activities, you, you can subscribe at our website. Uh, this uh, session will be recorded and available uh, on demand in a short while on the Bright Talk platform. And if you require a copy of the uh, PDF, uh, it's available on our website. Um, just go to uh, sneer.org slash Europe and you'll see it. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this webcast. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Alex McDonald. And uh, we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye-bye.